invited to come and, and listen or to speak. You won't have to listen to me all night. It's part of the night. So uh, I encourage you to come to that. And Ron mentioned the uh, the revival prayer meeting Monday night. That is the last revival prayer meeting. Next Sunday, when uh, church is convened, John Moore will be here. So uh, we encourage you to come and uh, pray with us that God will move. Okay? So good morning. And uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, New Life Family Worship Center. We're glad you've decided to be with us, to worship with us this morning. And we pray that God will speak to you through His Holy Word today. We know that you could be somewhere else, and uh, so again, thanks for coming and joining us. So, today we start a new section in Scripture. It's a familiar section. It has the same overarching theme that we've been looking at. We'll again speak to God's uh, setting aside of Israel, but uh, in this instance we will be speaking specifically of His setting aside His chosen people so that God might be glorified, okay? And today we're just going to take a little piece of that first, a uh, uh, little piece of that, that scripture section. Romans 11, 25 and 26. Romans 11, 25 and 26. If you're mentally prepared to examine the word of God and your heart is open to God's leading in your life today, would you signify that by saying amen? Amen. amen. And would you please join me uh, in standing out of respect for for the reading of God's holy word. Romans 11, 25 and 26 is as follows, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Okay, thank you. You can be seated. So, this setting aside of Israel is, uh, as we have seen, has been very purposeful. Uh, God has done it for a uh, definitive purpose. He set them aside. We've looked at the idea. He set them aside to bring salvation to the Gentiles. He set them aside so that uh, by the salvation of the Gentiles, uh, Israel would become jealous. They too would yearn for the blessings of a Messiah, a Messiah that they once rejected. They will one day come to know as their personal Savior. They will, uh, they will come to recognize who He is and how He is. But as is always the case, the ultimate overriding purpose of anything God does is so that God might be glorified. The first outline, the first uh, blank in your outline is glorified. In this section of scripture that we begin to study today, it will close with the 36th verse. And in that verse, we're going to find a doxology, uh, a closing statement that uh, Paul has been writing what really has to be considered doctrine of the church. And he's going to close this doctrine of the church, and he's going to do it by focusing on the idea that the purpose of everything that God does is to glorify himself. In that 36th verse, listen, if, you, uh, if, you have, if you've ever been to an old uh, Catholic service, you would hear these words sung, For of him and through him and to him. All things to whom be glory forever. Amen. It's a simple doxology. It's a phrase that closes off, a, 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 it has the purpose of closing off a thought. And it glorifies God. And when he says, to whom be glory forever, that's exactly what Paul is trying, that's the point he's trying to make. So let's look at this then. So the supreme benefit, the supreme benefit of God's redemptive plan for both Jews and for Gentiles is to bring them to salvation and eternal life. But the supreme 
purpose of that redemptive plan is to glorify God. Who benefits? We do, okay? But the purpose is to glorify God. Even with God, everything has that same purpose. His purpose in judging the unrighteous is to glorify Himself. His preparation of heaven for the saved is to glorify Himself. The, his purpose in, in preparing hell for the un, unsaved is to display His glory. And you know, we, we've studied numerous times how the purpose of every created being and thing in the universe is to glorify God. All other divine intentions are subservient to that supreme and ultimate goal, glorifying God. You've hold, heard me quote before from the West, Westminster Catechism. It says, the chief end of man is to glorify God. And then it says, and enjoy Him forever. The two things are co-mingled. Glorify God, enjoy Him forever. Now, if you don't glorify God, you're not going to enjoy Him forever, are you? Remember, we did a series on, is this our faith? What was the first step in examining our faith? Well, the first step in examining faith is to obtain faith, and you do that by confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you don't do that, then you can't take another step. Now, there's two aspects of God's glory that we want to discuss this, this morning. This is kind of an introduction. And the first of these is what we call, the first uh, aspect of God's glory is what we call intrinsic glory. That's the glory which is part of God's very being. It is God's nature. In other words, God is so glorious that God can't help to, but be glorious. You understand? It is, who, what he, it is who and what He is. This is because glory is the very essence of God. It is the manifestation of who He is. It is that which He possesses in Himself, and it can't be taken away from Him. And incidentally, God was never given any glory. God has always been glorious. 100% uh, glorious, 100% of the time. It is this radiant, essential glory that Moses spoke of in Exodus 33, 18. Moses said, please show me your glory. That's the glory Moses wanted to see. To see. He's saying to God, reveal yourself to me. It is that glory which one of the seraphim declared to another before the Lord in the heavenly vision by Isaiah 6, 3, where he said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of of His glory. It is that glory that Stephen <coughs> proclaimed before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem in Acts 7 2 when he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. When he says that, he says, Brothers and fathers, listen. That's what he's saying. He's trying to get their attention. Hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. He's telling them about God's glory. It is that glory which was in Jesus, the glory of God's full, it says, grace and truth in John 1, 14. And it's that glory which was manifested in Matthew 17, 2, when Jesus uh, was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? That glory that is so glorious that it actually illuminates light. In fact, heaven will be illuminated by glory. There won't be any light switches. You won't have to worry about any of those special bulbs that the government's trying to make you buy. Everything will be illuminated by glory. So that is the first aspect of God's glory. It's His intrinsic glory, the glory which is part of His very being and nature. The second aspect of God's glory is that which is rendered unto Him. This is the honor that men and angels render to the Lord who made them. That glory does not, of course, add the least, least bit up to God's intrinsic glory because that's fixed. God is glorious. He is complete. He is perfect. But this type of glory, rather, is the recognition by you and I and the affirmation of the glory of God. This is what we, by our words, by our actions, by our proclamations, this is what we display 
of God's glory to the world around us. As a believer, you have God's Holy Spirit dwelling within you, correct? Yeah. All right, with that Spirit dwelling within you, you have a piece of that glory. And as you walk the streets of Benson, or wherever else you might be, you need to illuminate people with pieces of that glory so that they will be drawn to Jesus. So that they will see, uh, it says that we're supposed to be different people. Actually, that word means peculiar. You should seem strange to other people. Because no matter what the adversity you might be faced with, no matter what the circumstance you might be faced with, when other people get mad, when other people get sad, you get glorious. And you portray that glorious to the world, that glory to the world around you, and people say, how come you're different? How can you live with that? What makes it easier for you? It is this glory which uh, the priestly chorus sang when David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. It's in uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 23 and 24. He said, sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. And then a few verses later in 28 and 29 it says, Give to the Lord, O families of the people, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. God is due glory just by his name. Now, because man's supreme purpose is to recognize and honor God for His glory and majesty, conversely, failure to glorify God is the mark of spiritual rebellion and ungodliness. Did you know that? If you sit here today and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you know what that means? That you don't glorify Him. See, you can only do one or the other. You don't get to play in neutral territory. You can't be like the Swiss and have neutrality. In God's program, there's the righteous and the unrighteous. There's the saved and the unsaved. There's no middle ground. You either glorify God or you dishonor God. One way or the other. That's the only way it can be. That's the way it has to be. That's the way God designed it to be. There's a heaven and there's a hell. There's nothing in between, folks. There's no holding pen. There's no purgatory. There's none of that other stuff. There's one place or another. And when you don't glorify God, it's a mark that you are rebel. Because, see, well, you say, well, I don't know anything about God. Yes, you do. According to the Word of God, you do. That's the, the you know, this isn't conjecture. I don't make up this stuff. This isn't conjecture on my part. Paul explains way back in Romans 1, we examined, what, three years ago, we examined in Romans 1 when we were at the beginning of this letter that there's no excuse for any person living at any time, at any, any time in history, any place, no matter where you're from, how you've been, there's no reason for anyone to refuse to glorify God. Romans 1, 18 through 21, this is what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. When you don't know God, when you don't recognize who God is, that's because you are keeping the truth down within yourself. You don't want to recognize the truth. And he goes on, because what may be, what may be known of God is manifest in them. In other words, you have a seed inside of you that tells you who God is. You already know who God is. And then he goes on, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, Paul writes, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You don't get an excuse. You can't go when you when you when you pass on and you stand before Jesus Christ in judgment, you can't say, I didn't know. That's indefensible. You can't say, Well, my mama didn't tell me. That's indefensible. God told you, according to His Word. God told you. And then he, he finishes. Because although they knew God, listen, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their 
foolish hearts were darkened. That's my, that's my favorite Greek word. That foolish word. It means they were moronic in nature. They were morons. Yeah, that's what it means. We, tra we translate it to few foolish. It doesn't sound so harsh. See, God chose his people Israel. It says in Jeremiah 13.11, God chose His people Israel that they, He said that they may, may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory. And later on, that same prophet in the 16th verse says, Give glory to the Lord your God before He causes darkness. You either give God glory, or sooner or later you will find yourself in darkness. Okay? The most powerful man in the history of the world... Well, the most powerful man in the world at this particular time in history, back in, in Daniel 4, was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Most powerful, he was the king of Babylon. And he refused. God spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and he refused to listen. And he was a man of great pride. He was a man of great arrogance. He was a powerful man, a man of great intellect. But one day he was walking around on the roof of his palace. He had a beautiful garden. As well, he had, he had hanging gardens. He had a beautiful, beautiful palace. And he was walking around on the roof of his palace telling himself how glorious he was. And in Daniel 4.31 it says, While the, world was, by the word was still in his mouth, a voice fell from heaven that said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. Okay? Then in verse 33 it says, That very hour, if the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, he was driven from men, he ran away from his own palace, okay? And he ran out into the fields and he started to eat grass like oxen. His body was wet with dew from heaven. In other words, he ran around nude. And his hair grew, he, had, he, didn't, he no longer shaved, his hair was, he grew long fingernails, it says like bird's claws. In other words, he went crazy. He thought he knew it all. He thought he was the most glorious man on the face of the earth. And so here he is, once the most powerful man, the greatest army that the world had seen up to that point, and then in verse 34, listen to his words. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me because he repented. In essence, what Nebuchadnezzar does here is he repents. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. I think Nebuchadnezzar got saved. He saw the light. He figured out where his real position was, that he was merely a sinful man, and he gave God the glory. When the people of Tyre and Sidon flattered King Herod Agrippa, in Acts 12, 22 and 23, it says that the people kept shouting at the king, and they said, the voice of a god and not of a man. Well, I've never had that shouted at me. The voice of a god and not of a man. And then it says, immediately, and I'm lucky I have it, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, it says, because he did not give glory to God, and then what happened to him? He was eaten by worms and died. Wow. That's a tough, that's a tough act to follow. But the contrast to that, the other side of that is when Cornelius met Peter, it says in Acts 10, 25 and 26, it says, Cornelius fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But what did Peter do? Peter lifted him up and he said, Stand up, I myself am also a man. It's like the pagans of Lystra that heard Paul speak and witness the circle. Uh, Paul uh, uh, healed a cripple in Acts 14. And the, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying uh, in their language, they said, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men, calling Paul a god. And Barnabas they called Zeus and, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. But in verse, verses 14 and 15 we see Barnabas and Paul's response. It says, when they heard this, 
they tore their clothes and ran amongst the multitude, crying out, saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. They didn't want to be glorified. We shouldn't want to be glorified. We have one to glorify, and that is God. So throughout redemptive history, God has called men and women to give praise, honor, and worship to Him, and to ascribe to Him His worthiness. God is infinitely holy. He is, he is our majestic Creator. He is our Savior and Lord. And the purpose of all things, angels, the purpose of men, the purpose of all creatures, the purpose of life, even the purpose of death, the purpose of heaven, the purpose of hell, the purpose of the land and seas and, and, and all the skies, the entire, entire purpose of the universe is to display the majesty of a holy, sovereign creator who made them all and to lead all creatures then to glorify him. Now with a far greater obligation and privilege than those outside of the church's walls, believers can and should glorify God. You know why? Because we have witnessed His glory in His saving grace. Amen. Not all are called. We have been called to His saving grace. We therefore should continually proclaim, as Paul says in Ephesians 3.21, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The most certain reason that God will eventually uh, redeem Israel is that His word has to be fulfilled to the praise of His glory. He ordained in Isaiah 43, 21, He said, This people have formed for Myself, they shall declare My praise. Now in our present scripture, which is, as I've said, this is the end of Paul's uh, his treatment of this idea uh, of God's gracious dealing with Israel, we will see God glorified in several ways. First of all, we will see Him glorified in His sovereignty. Secondly, we will see Him glorified in His integrity. Thirdly, we will see Him glorified in His generosity. And then fourthly, we will see him glorified in his incomprehensibility. It's not easy to say. Harder to spell. So that's really our introduction to this. To this uh, and we're only going to be on this section for a few more weeks, and then we'll continue on with uh, uh, the next section that Paul speaks about. I'd like to close with a thought for today. And, uh, you know, when we meet again next Sunday... We're going to meet with the intent of a revival. In, in Proverbs 14, 34, it tells us that righteousness exalts a nation, but, uh, but sin is a reproach to any people. Okay? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, since I've been saved uh, 22 years ago, I have attempted to become a Bible scholar, and uh, I've done all right at it, not, not as good as I should have, but one thing, as I've studied God's Word, I have been struck by its accuracy. <clears throat> you know, they, the archaeologists will go out in the Middle East and they'll make a discovery, and they'll think, wow, that's really neat. But in you, almost, a lot of the time, what happens is they'll make a discovery of something they didn't know. But if they had read the Bible, they would have already known it. Because they find things in the Middle East that do nothing but substantiate the Word of God. God's Word is 100% accurate 100% of the time. And, you know, God lives in a realm of eternity. We don't quite understand that. I don't know how it works, but He sees the future as clearly as we see our past. I think he sees the future actually more clearly than we see our past. As I get older, it's harder for me to see the past. But our Bible maps out events for us that are spoken of in the end times that are very vivid, very rich for us. And one thing in, about end times prophecy is that there is no mention of the greatest superpower on earth at this particular moment in end times prophecy. 
the United States of America. Where is our nation in end times prophecy? Where, are we not in end times prophecy? Well, I'd like to offer three theories for you in regards to end times prophecy. One possibility is that our country will be devastated by war or terrorism. Uh, a lot of the vivid descriptions of the book of Revelation sound a lot like nuclear war. Not only is there war, but then there's famine, there's pestilence, there's plague that follow after. So that's one theory. Maybe we'll be devastated by war or terrorism. Another possibility is the United States will simply decline as a world power as it is currently. As our nation becomes more and more secular in nation, uh, a secular nation, we will reap the inevitable results of our sin. God says that. It says in Proverbs, righteousness, righteousness exalts a nation. Are we being exalted? Or are we in the position of sin being our reproach? We could perhaps uh, fade away into obscurity. Maybe we, maybe as we have pushed God out of our lives, we have pushed ourselves back into a corner. But there's one last theory, and this is the theory I personally like. Okay? The United States of America is not mentioned in descriptions of the last days because there may be a great nationwide spiritual awakening. And with that great nationwide spiritual awakening, when the rapture takes place, a vast majority of the United States population will leave the planet Earth. We will be raptured up. And can you imagine the effect that that would have on our nation's economy? If 50% of us left, 60% of us had left, 70% of us left, what would happen to the economy? It would collapse overnight. It would be nothing left of our economy. So I prefer that theory. But I don't know the answer. But I do know this. Jesus is coming again. And if he were to come back today, right here, right now, would you be ready? Are you ready for his return? Because he's coming. The handwriting is on the wall. It's going to happen. So we're going to have a time of invitation with the praise and worship tent. The team leads us in a song. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll give a chance. We want the Holy Spirit to have great freedom to move amongst us, to speak to our hearts in regards to our readiness. Both ready for revival and ready as individuals. So I'm, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer and uh, as they, uh, the praise and worship team comes and leads us, uh, when I get done with the prayer, they'll lead us in a song. And, and it's, it's our prayer as a church that uh, if Christ is calling you, don't, don't be scared of it. Because He only calls you out of love. He calls you out of mercy. He calls you out of grace. So let me lead us in a prayer, uh, if you would uh, stand with me, and then if you would go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes, and, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would move as you desire in our hearts, in our minds. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, have mercy on us, search our hearts, Lord, where we have failed you, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask, Lord, uh, for purity of heart. I ask, Lord, that you forgive me for my sins. Lord, I think we have to have pure hearts for you to hear, even hear us. So, Lord, individually, corporately, we come and we seek your forgiveness. And then, Lord, we, we seek what it is you desire of us. For an older Christian, it, it might be a, a refreshing new walk with you. For a, uh, a Christian of a few years, it might be a, a remembrance of that first love when we uh, were first drawn to you. But Lord, uh, I firmly believe that there's numerous people here this morning that don't know you as Lord and Savior. And for them, Lord, we cry out that your Spirit would touch them now and allow them to come forward. Allow them.
them, Lord, to recognize who you are and how you are. Allow them to understand that you sent your Son to die for them on a cross in Calvary, leaving the glory of heaven, being born in a stable. He came because he loved us. And Father, we pray that that would be imprinted upon each and every heart here. We pray, Lord, that we would understand that Jesus lived a perfect life here on earth, that he lived a life without sin, and when he was sacrificed upon the cross, he was sacrificed sacrificed as a sinless man, a man who uh, only came to take our, our sin away, a man who traded his righteousness, his perfectness, he traded that for our sinfulness, and he took that sin from us, Lord. And we want to thank you that for that, Father, and we want to acknowledge that in our lives, that you call us to perfection just as you are. We want to, we want to, we want to partake of your image in our lives today. And Lord, we want, to, we want to declare to the world how you died on that cross, how you were buried in three days later in victory over death, in victory over sin, you rose again. And now, Lord, you sit in heaven and you're interceding for us each and every day, each and every moment, holding us close, helping us to walk on this face of the earth and glorify your Father in all we do. Father, we give this time to you. Whatever the situation might be, Lord, it might be a, a time for salvation. It might be a time for membership. It might be a time to be scripturally baptized. Prayer needs. The altar's open, Lord. Whatever you desire, we give this time to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.